Hi, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, sort of, I'm working now at the University of Manchester doing uh, description logic in general and um, now in particular. And this is a joint work with the <coughs> colleagues from the Institute of the Atmospheric Optics, uh, Alexander Kosbiv and Alexei Kurzensev, and Alexander is here as well. So if you want to ask uh, questions on the domain area or how the ontology is built and worked, just ask him. So uh, this talk is going to be about the knowledge base for quantitative spectroscopy. Um, and we start with describing the problem, uh, what are we solving with this knowledge base, then to a short overview of the domain area, and uh, finally we'll have a detailed look at the knowledge base we, we built up. So what's the problem? Uh, we do, well, in the Institute of Atmospheric Optics, they built a system called WADIS, which is uh, an integrated quantitative spectroscopy database. So they integrate all the resources corresponding to um, spectroscopy of uh, nine main molecules, put together data from more than 200, 2,500 publications, and organize it in a way that this data is accessible. In, in different ways. <coughs> so, uh, what's the information sources in our in our settings? Information source is a publication, but publication can cover very different areas. So, we choose one molecular for, for, from the publication, choose a task which is solved in the in the publication, and the method used to, to solve the task. So, information source is a combination of these four. And the solutions to the problem, to, to the task, uh, using given method for given molecule, is uh, something the, the main data we are looking for in, in our problem. But uh, the same problem uh, can be described in different information sources, right? And the solutions can be different from from source to source. So we have a problem. So sometimes data is consistent through different sources, sometimes, sometimes it's not, and it's mainly because different methods gives different, uh, have a different um, precision. So there are more precise methods, there are less precise methods, and having uh, different solutions may give different results for the same problem. So the question now is how do we ensure the, or check the validity of the problem described in the information source? And for this purpose we, building a knowledge base to, to help experts to establish the validity of uh, published spectral data. And the validity problems can be split into two parts. One are the formal constraints, like uh, okay, some very similar ones, like quantum numbers are actually numbers, and all the things are, some, some of the parameters are numbers, some of them are strings, are more precise, restrictions on the data, like wave number is something from 0 to 45,000 and so on. So some things that, some errors which could be checked during the loading of the data. Uh, there are some rules for some restrictions that comes from the domain area, uh, like few elements of the solution have set certain restrictions for a given molecule and these restrictions are changed from one molecule to another, but still they, they're true for every, everything in the domain area. And again, some ones that can be checked automatically is the publication constraint. So whether the solution is published somewhere or not, or is it just something else than a publication of information source. But all these things could be checked more or less automatically. But there are some non-formal constraints, so for which we need to ask experts to check whether they're, they're violated or not. And uh, this, this thing is just like, well, experts compare the two information sources which is, relates to a similar problem and decides if, if, if these two sources disagree on a particular problem. So uh, experts decide which solution is correct, which is not, if it's possible. And if it's possible, they just publish the results in the uh, 
uh, uh, somewhere. So we have at the moment four big publications of such an expert things, and you see the latest ones are really of this year, and there are more to come. So our knowledge base is uh, aimed to help to automatize such a process. So uh, now to the uh, model of the domain. So this is quite a scary picture, but roughly what it says, <coughs> we do, for, for every molecule we have three direct tasks, T1, to T3, which uh, can be solved using the theoretical methods. So you take a theory, take a data, give a solution. And there are um, inverse problems. So after you obtain the data from the experiments, you can solve inverse problems to, to get the real data. And uh, you can compare the theoretical data from the left column to uh, experimental data you got, substitutions you got from the, the right hand column. And so, uh, just, just the same things said in a different words. So you take a single molecule, you choose a task you wish to uh, get data on. Then uh, you take a problem described in, in the source, in the information source. And then in the ontology, uh, there are that ontology describes the properties of the solutions, not the solution itself, which is raw data, but uh, properties of the solution, so the metadata. And uh, there are two types of um, such properties. Uh, there are properties of a single task, like T1, T2, or T6 here. And there are properties of pairs of tasks, of, of a direct task like T1 and corresponding inverse task T7. In this case, we compare the properties of the solutions, of the pairs of the solutions, like, uh, okay, if we want to check the uh, deviation, the, the, the quality of the task, like, uh, we could use the root mean square deviation to check the correctness. Okay, now to the uh, knowledge base itself. Uh, we have this knowledge base uh, split it into three uh, layers. The top one is uh, the base ontology layer, which is uh, roughly speaking the description of the domain. So we do have, we, we split this layer into three different uh, ontologies, which describes uh, part of the domain each. So the meta ontology describes the properties of a matter, so different atoms, different molecules, and their properties. Uh, the spectroscopy part describes the uh, properties of the quantitative spectroscopy tasks uh, which we're interested in. Uh, it can be, well, we'll see later what, what it looks like. And the information source ontology describes the property of the information source, as I said, like a name of publication, publication year, which molecule is involved, which uh, method is used, and so on. So this is all the very top level ontologies. It might be called the foundational ones, but we don't do, do it like this. Uh, it's just phase one which defines the uh, common uh, vocabulary for, for the rest. Then the application ontology layer comes, and here is the description of what is known in, the, in our system, what is uh, about this or that particular uh, molecule tasks. So this is done automatically for uh, it's, it's done by automatic annotation of the data about information sources uh, which is in a system. And so here, here how it works roughly speaking. We're starting from the publication. So we have a paper written or published somewhere. This paper contains uh, raw unstructured uh, text, uh, well, information hidden in the text, as well as some data which is uh, fills in, in, in the tables. Uh, from these uh, tables and 
informal description, textual description. We got the entry in a system which have some uh, abstract, which is in plain text, and some more uh, values set in a field. So that, well, it's not very clear to, to see, but it's definitely uh, visible that there are some values and well, properties and values for them. And this notation is done automatically from the, from the database. And out of this um, entry in a, in a database, we do build uh, an element of, of an A-box. So we have uh, individuals for the entry, we have individuals for the values, and all, all the properties uh, get their values according to this thing. So, and the uh, application layer ontology contains this definition taken from the knowledge of God in the system. And for the um, task, uh, for the properties of the solution of a single task, like I, I want, the uh, structure of the data, individual data may look like this. So we've got a um, particular information source. We, it has some references, some links to the diff description of the input data and output data, and some very uh, domain specific values like energy levels and quantum numbers are also described there. And so for this sort of tasks, for the uh, properties of a solution of individual tasks, the structure is fixed and quite simple, so 21, 21 axioms per information source. And this is more complicated thing definitely, so this is a description of a uh, correlation of, of a properties of a solution of a, by a pair of a solutions of tasks, sorry. Uh, so we do have two, uh, two solutions and we compare them. So again, I don't want to go into the details, but uh, for, for this comparison we've got not a fixed number of axioms per, per, per single thing, but it depends on the Side of the data, roughly speaking, described in in, the, in both of the uh, information services. And it's it's rather big. So, a bit of statistics here. We do uh, have have this ontology for uh, all the nine, oh, well, most most part of the nine molecules in the system, but uh, most of them are done for the most. Um, for the most common molecules like water and carbon dioxide. So, and for the, you can see that uh, roughly the estimation of the size of the ontology. So for water, for example, for uh, individual uh, tasks, we have about 500 individuals and about 400,000 axioms. Uh, in this, in this application ontology. For the uh, tasks, for, for pairs, we've got uh, something like 8,000 individuals and about a million of uh, accents. Uh, right, and now to the user ontology, to the very uh, bottom layer. And this user ontology actually corresponds to the queries the user would like to ask. <laughs> So it's done in the ontology just to, uh, as an ontology, just to save the uh, problem user would like to ask uh, locally and allow user to, to modify it in a necessary way. So it starts with the, 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 the interface to, to this query is as follows. So we start with a uh, building an ontology and deciding which, which part of the which data exactly user would like to, to get out of the system. Then user chooses uh, one or more than one uh, molecules which he's going to work with. And then uh, he chooses a task he would like to, look at the query actually, he would like to ask over the data coming from the system. 
and the list of queries like like here. So it's uh, some standard query that cover a lot of uh, area of in the system. And we choose two of them, like operational pens found in direct tasks. And uh, the second one is did number four data sources contain transitions in a selected range. And this is their description in the Manchester's index for the OWL2 ontology language. And uh, so the system is quite flexible. So if user just wants to know exactly this, exactly what's in a, uh, in a set of uh, queries, it, it can just take the queries that is and run this query on a part of the ontology which is described on a um, uh, user ontology design phase. But uh, if user is more experienced and would like to change somehow, you can see that there are um, some numerical values involved in, in some of the queries. So it's possible to adjust the query to the particular needs in order to shift the interval somehow or um, change the set of uh, user tasks or something like this. And for very experienced users, this the, the query to the system could be written uh, just straight from scratch. So um, that's more or less it. Just to summarize what we've done, we uh, tackling the problem of validity of the data which is published, um, quantitative data which is published. Uh, somewhere. Uh, we're using the ontology of information sources to do so, and this ontology contains three layers. The base layer, which describes the uh, area, which sets up the vocabulary of the domain area. The application one, which contains the data, um, annotation of the data, which is in the system in a way that uh, ontology could, could use. And the user ontology, which actually responds to a query, user query to the data. And uh, the system is available, so please feel free to try it. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, I have a set of questions for you. Um, you talk about your knowledge base. Uh, can you give some indications about the size of the knowledge base, how many triples you have? Uh, and what kind of knowledge base store you use? Well, it's probably uh, the, the type of uh, knowledge base is probably to the Alexander, who is actually the director of a system. So, roughly speaking, the uh, size is here. So, the top level ontology is rather small. It's about 400 individuals, um, uh, 2700 axioms. The ontologies for the uh, application in the application layer is really huge, well, not huge, but quite large. So for the water, for example, we have about ten, well, just under 10,000 individuals and about 1,400,000 axioms. And for, for, other, uh, for other types of molecules, their size is slightly smaller because the water is much better, it takes much more. Uh, interest, so it's researched better than the rest, but still they're quite significant. And the user ontology is, we don't know actually because it's up to user how, how they define it, but roughly speaking it's, it's, it's more or less like query, so it imports one or two application ontologies from the system and then write a few queries to it, so that's size of application ontology and, and, and plus one, one few cause of expressions, class expressions. Uh, which REF store do you use? I think it's, it's not an REF store, right? It's just plain owl, plain owl to ontologies. 